For our last bit of topics here, we want to be able to compute the mean and standard deviation of a binomial random variable. And this is really easy because there's formulas for them. Because the binomial distribution follows this particular pattern, which mathematically allows for the mean to just be this formula and the standard deviation to be this formula, period, the end. And they're on your note sheet if you look at your exam notes sheet right in here after all of that business about finding the probabilities and all of that right down here at the bottom the mean and the standard deviation they're written right there so you don't have to memorize it it's just a question of using it remember that of course n is our number of trials p is our probability of success and q right that q right there is the probability of failure and then here's the interpretation right out of n random trials we expect there to be the mean number of successes, right? There's that word expect again, right? Because the mean is your expected value. Give or take um, the standard deviation successes. And then, of course, we would give context and units and all of that good stuff for all those pieces. All right, so let's look at this. We have a student takes a multiple choice test that has 10 questions. Yes, each question has five choices, only one of which is correct. This sounds familiar because this is the same setup. The student randomly guesses each answer. Here's the histogram, blah, blah, blah. So we've already proven this is binomial. So remember, oh, I, I actually mentioned it. Here's the histogram for the probability decision for this binomial experiment, right? We already proved this was binomial. So we're going to compute the mean, and we're going to label it on the graph. And we're going to compute the standard deviation and label it as well. OK, um, maybe I should have given some space for this. So let me just kind of write it here. The mean is NP n times p. So n was 10, p is 1 fifth or 0.2. So if we take 10 and we multiply it by 1 fifth, grab decimals right here. So 10 times 1 fifth makes 2. Okay, wonderful. So that's 2. Right? It would be two questions correct, but that's fine. So we're going to label it on the graph. So right here is the mean, which was 2. OK, so now, oh, and you might want to you know, just remind yourself, hey, that's the mean. That's what that symbol stands for. Now what about the standard deviation? OK, the standard deviation is the square root. I'm just going to do it over here. The standard deviation is the square root NPQ. That's all multiplication in there. And you can put those dots in there in the formula if you like. You can kind of say to yourself, hey, that's N times P. That's the square root of N times P times Q. Mathematicians just don't write the dots because we're lazy. <laughs> I don't have any good reason for it. So down here, it'd be the square root of N, which is 10, times 1 fifth, which is P, times 4 fifths, which is Q, because of course they're complements, they have to add up to 1. If you have a 1 in 5 chance of guessing the question correctly, you have a 4 fifths chance of getting it wrong. Right, so that's P, that's Q. All right, well, let's see here. First thing, 1 take away 1 fifth, just so I can prove myself, it's 0.8 or 4 fifths. And you could use the decimals, of course. I'm not because the fractions are harder, so I'm trying to help people see how to use the fractions. Now, a square root. A square root is available underneath the palette. There's this little check mark symbol. Or you can type SQRT. It knows what you want. SQRT brings square root. And then you want 10 times 1 fifth and then arrow your way out of that fraction, so you're not in the denominator anymore, times 4 fifths. And there you see. And just for my own benefit, <laughs> so you can see SQRT 10 times 0.2 times 0.8 gives you the same result. Because of course, 1 fifth is, um, well, here I can show you, 1 fifth is 0.2. So it works with decimals or it works with fractions. I was just showing the fractions because I think it's more difficult. OK, so that is 1.265. Oh, they only wanted two decimal places. Really? I'm going to change that. Let's do three decimal places. <laughs> I'm, I'm making a decision here. Three decimal places. I'll, I'll fix that. <laughs> I'll, I'll change it. 
Now we're going to interpret the mean and standard deviation in the context. So using that script up above. So out of n, out of, and n for us was 10. So out of 10 random questions, Right, there's a context. So out of 10 random trials, our trials were questions on this um, quiz or this test. So out of 10 random questions, so that's your explanation of your trials. My pen is dying a little bit. All right. We expect there to be I say there to be, but it's really the student, right? So we expect this student, we can put a little more context in here, the student to guess mu successes. So two questions correctly. Two questions correctly. give or take 1.265 questions. Okay, so two questions correctly, that's the mean. Right here is the sigma, right? So we've got the number of trials, right? We said how many trials, and then we said we expect, and then this is context here. The student to guess two questions correctly, give or take 1.265. All right, what is the shape of this distribution? Well, it's obviously skewed right, <laughs> right? So skewed right. Explain why it makes sense. Well, the student is randomly guessing. We don't expect them to get a lot of questions correct, right? It would be unusual to get a lot of questions correct. Well, I'll, I'll write that up one second. There. So we expect, because the student is randomly guessing, we expect a low number to be correct. That's why all the bars on the low side are nice and tall, because that's what we expect. We expect it a lot um, on the low side. It would be very unusual for the student to guess many correct. That's why it's tapering off to essentially zero over here. Speaking of which, that's the last question. Is the probability of seven questions zero? as it appears on the graph. So if you look at 7, it looks like there's nothing there. And for that matter, 8, 9, and 10 aren't there either. Right? So is that really 0, the way it looks like it is? And the answer is no. Right? The probability of 7 exists. Actually, let me show you this graph in StatCrunch so you can kind of see it. In StatCrunch, if I do this graph, you can see 7 is this teeny tiny little one. So 7 is that little dot right there. And 8, which is not even on the graph, it's so small that they don't even include it. It's not 0. It's just really small. 9 is even smaller. 10 is even smaller than that. Right? Extremely, 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 extremely unlikely that a student would randomly guess all twest 10 questions correctly. Right? But the probability of 7 is not nothing. It's just really, really low so low that the graphing utility that I'm using to make this graph, which is actually not StatCrunch, it's a different program, doesn't even bother to put a bar or a dot or anything on these values. They're just that small. But they're not zero. So the probability of 7, I just found it in StatCrunch, is the probability that x equals 7. It's 0 0.00079, roughly. It's not zero. But what's happening is the probability of 7, and for that matter, the probability of 8, 9, and 10, are all so small, <laughs> so very, very small, that the computer can't graph them. They're literally smaller than the line it takes <laughs> to make the bottom x-axis. That's how tiny they are. And so the computer just can't handle it and does not graph them. But it doesn't mean they're 0. We have to keep in mind that it's always possible that x could be 10, 9, 8, and so on. Right? It can get up as high as whatever your n value is. Now for the last example, I want to remind you of one other thing that we learned way back in chapter 3. 
which is that the mean is the balance point of the graph. Right? And you can see it as you look at this graph. This too is where this graph is balancing. If this was a teeter-totter or a seesaw, you'd put the fulcrum right here and you'd get the left and the right side to balance. Now why am I going over that? Well, because that's how we're going to figure out the next question. It's actually really quick and easy once you know what you're doing. So I have three normal, or excuse me, binomial probability distributions drawn here. I have one where the probability of success was 0.3, one where it was 0.5, and one where it's 0.7. So all I have to do is figure out which ones of these is which one. Now the easiest one to spot is probably the 0.5, because you're thinking 50-50, it's got to be the symmetric one. And it is, right? But let me show you how you can tell. The mean, remember, is n times p for a binomial distribution, right? And these are, I should say, for these um, following binomial distribution graphs, these are all binomial. I should have clarified that. I will fix that for next time. <laughs> so for all these binomial distribution graphs, right, n is equal to 15. So 15 times 0.5 is... Let me go grab Desmos. Um, I'll close all this. We don't need this. 15 times 0.5 is 7.5, which when you look at it on the graph, that is the balance point. Look, it's balancing right at 7.5. Right, so that's the balance point. Okay, now let's look at the other two. Well, one of these has to be for the probability of success is 0.3 and one has to be 0.7. Which, when you think about it, if P is 0.7, that means you expect high values, right? So N times P is 15 times 0.7. And again, you can use parentheses or you can use a dot, it doesn't matter. So let me grab 15 times 0.7, and while I'm on the subject, 15 times 0.3, there we have it. So 10.5 and 4.5 should be the other balance points. So look at this, right? This one's balancing at about 10 and a half, right? 10.5, right? So there's your balance point right there. And then this one is 15 times 0.3 which is 4.5, right? And that's your balance point right there. So this one, right, we haven't answered the question yet. So they wanted us to say which one is which. So this one is P equals 0 0.3. This one's P equals 0 0.7. And then the first one was P equals 0 0.5. Done just by using the fact that the mean is the balance point and the means a very easy calculation to make. You just multiply your number of trials times your probability of success and you're done. Easy as that.